G'day! Welcome to Chalk Cine Control. Today, we're talking to Elton James. Do you tend to work from like a, a like a strong template show, or do you kind of create it as you go? Um, I work from a strong template. I'd say is my. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of you know if it ain't broke don't fix it. Uh, yeah. Philosophy of programming where like every time I start a new show, like talking hog show files, I'll start from I'll start from a template that I created on the previous show and adjust from there. Um, especially if I have a repeat gaffer, like if, uh, like my next show, I'm working with the same gaffer that I worked with on my current show that I worked with on Hawkeye. So I know the things that are baked into my show files are the kinds of things that he's generally asking for, or the things he's familiar with and say, yeah, Hey, do you remember that random cyan color we called Christmas cyan number three? Um, can you throw that on the sky panel over there? Yeah. Um, I don't have to look it up because I know I've been working with this guy enough that I've got, I can just, Oh, be like, okay, I'll, I'll pre I'll, I'll cook that into my template. Yeah. Um, and, and also there's a lot of things that I like to do during prep, like during the first camera test, um, I'll ask the fixtures department to bring me a sample of every bit of, um, every bit of, uh, led ribbon that they are planning on using for the show. So that I can sit there with a C800 color meter and do color temperature uh, calibration readings and create a set of color temperature palettes that are precise using my gaffers. I always prefer to use the gaffers color meter, not my own, because that way, if anybody questions me, I can just say, hey, boss, I used your color meter. I don't know what's going on. It's I, I used yours. Come on. <laughs> Plausible deniability. But, and so I'll sit there and I'll, I'll grab that and I'll spend like in all the time, all the downtime in a hair and makeup test that's always happens. I'll sit there and make use of that time and just, you know, calibrate all of the RGB ribbon so I can get good white points for that. I'll figure out what this year's version of cinema series light ribbon is or whatever light ribbon that they happen to be using. Um, so that I have something that is exact that I can that I can say this will be this when I say this is 5600 I can know for a fact that this is within 50 degrees of being 5600 um and 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 I've carried all of and I save all of those those are all cooked into my those every time I do one of those I yeah. label what it is and I keep it in my template so it's all in my template so if I see that thing again I don't have to do the work again I've already done it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, like I kind of do a thing like I work within, I, I tend to work within one big show file. I know you kind of do it a little differently, but I keep everything in one show file. And so That's, I, uh, ask... I uh, Mitch and I like to call that the one show file to rule them all. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, what I tend to do is it's like anything sub, anything less than a thousand is my first unit stuff. And so, you know, 500s might be kind of random you know, a couple of these, a couple of those, something else, you know, 600s is always Ari stuff. 700s is always my Titans. Um, 800s is, I can't remember right now, but you know, like, so I break things up like that. And so when we build the first stage, we put a one in front of everything. So 601 is my first, first unit S60. 1601 is my first S60 on stage one. And then, you know, the same thing when we move to stage two. So even if we don't use all the numbers, in the whole thing, it's like there's some consistency there. Yeah, you always know that I, it doesn't matter what the first number is. Six hundred one's a sky panel. I really like that system. Um, I uh, I just have found that on larger shows, trying to do that system, it falls apart. Um, if you're doing a show where you've got, you know, twelve stages with one hundred and seven sets and. Yeah. Uh, a big warehouse and 27 locations and whatever, whatever. I'm certainly not rattling off numbers of what my next job is going to be because that's stuck on the top of my head. <laughs> uh, 
But it's when you're doing when you get to the economy of scale, those kind of systems start to fall apart. And that's where I use my strong where I where I rely on my template system as much as possible, because it's just it becomes such a bookkeeping problem. If I did one show file to rule them all, it would be I we'd be talking about at the end of the day, I'd probably have 7000 Astera tubes patched. Right. Right. Um, and it would just become it would become a much bigger problem. Now on my current show, I'm actually doing your system exactly. Um, um, different numbering scheme uh, where I I actually prefer for the main unit and any light that the that a lamp operator might touch, I prefer to use four digit numbers for them uh, for the fixture IDs. And the reason being, if a if a lamp operator reads off a number to me and it is less than four digits, I know they're accidentally reading me the DMX address and I can say, what's the fixture ID, buddy? That's clever. That's yeah. clever. And that's then a, there's, I, a, there's a trick I, for I'm new players. I'm also very intentional about what all of those places in the four digit number mean. So yes. the, um, like if it's a 4,000, for some reason I chose 4,000 to be my main unit truck package lights so if it's a four thousand number it is in the truck package now if it's a four thousand two hundred number i know that that is a um orbiter an airy orbiter um and then the last two digits are the number of the 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 unit number of that fixture type so the i use the the thousands to be location i use the hundreds to be type and then I use the last two digits, the tens and the ones, to be the unit number within. Um, unless we get silly and we have over 100 fixtures, which that would never happen. Why would that ever happen? Right. Yeah. Board ops, we're in a very strange position because we are some of the only people that never get to work with our colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, we I mean, that's gener- the reason... That's a reason to go to LDI every year because you get to bump into all the programmers that you yeah. never ever get to see. <laughs> I mean, that's half the reason I go to LDI is so I can finally meet the people I've been, you know, making stupid jokes with on the Facebook group for the last two years. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, j- just so I can specifically know, oh, you're Jason Young. You're the one who I told uh, that Q only is 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 the devil's tool. Yeah, yeah, tracking for life. <laughs> I bet that went went down well. <laughs> it was great. Um, by the way, um, if you're if you if you think tracking uh, Q only is the best way to do anything on a modern console, every modern console is a tracking console. So no matter what you're doing, you're tracking. It doesn't matter if you think you're Q only. Um, I'm not touching that with a ten foot pole. But that said, I'll say this: I'll give everybody credit. There are plenty of appropriate times to use Q only instead of tracking and there are plenty of appropriate times to use tracking instead of queue only it depends on what your workflow is and it depends where you're going but generally i stick with track i start i start tracking and then i use queue only when i have to yeah and if i was doing episodic if i was doing episodic i'd probably do queue only instead of tracking but that's because mostly you're stealing stuff from whole scenes and whole episodes and just going, I want this episode, bink, bink, versus versus my workflow on, on a feature is more like, how does the day progress? And we're building on, it's like we're building layers of an onion. So it's just like peeling back layers when I want to go back cues. So tracking makes more sense to me. Yeah. No, I've, I've had that discussion with several different programmers from different um, areas. And it's like, you know, like game show guys, a lot of those guys will do Q only because they can pull stuff in and clump it together. And, you know, guys that are doing live performance music stuff, it's like, oh, I've got the building blocks all over here. So I'll just grab all these building blocks and kind of ram them together. And that's how we do the light show. It's kind of interesting to hear how different people approach it, you know. And so yeah. I think for both techniques, there's an argument of how to do it, but it's, you know, reliant on what you're doing at that time. It's like, what's the best tool at this moment? Uh, Right now, I'd say it's some AirPod Pros. (laughs) What do you think the skills, if any, from any of your previous sort of careers have kind of 
you know, transmorphed into the, into what you do now. When I was working as an IT guy at Harvard, um, who'd have thought that my time working as an IT guy would be directly prescient to my job as a lighting programmer in the film industry. Yeah. Um, I spend an awful lot of time discussing managed networks and talking about, you know, IP protocols and um, managing managing a complicated Wi-Fi network with multiple VLANs and um, making fun of how terrible uh, my my favorite my chosen lighting console's uh, networking protocol is. Hog is a great system. It's uh, its protocol is not very. It's old. It was written in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, and that actually relates back to a previous question, which is some information you had asked about what are things that other skills that we should have. Mm -hmm. um, I would highly, highly, highly recommend anyone interested in being a board op to um, familiarize yourself with media servers, with pixel mapping with how media interacts with lighting instruments and how and how using these video walls and how 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 using these video walls as lighting instruments um, if you're leaving if you're leaving that up to a different team to be running you're really missing out on a a valuable collaborative experience on set and b a a skill that really should be a part of what we do. If we're lighting actors with these units and we're doing things with it, we should know how to do it. Um, and so I'm I'm typically on shows that use media servers and use video walls as lighting instruments, not as a video wall that's a jumbotron behind an actor that's a part of the story. I'm talking right. about you know interactive Direct lighting on the actor's sources. faces where we have yeah. big giant video walls where the actors are are driving a car and and it's just the environment and we're just paying attention to the stuff on their faces and on the car and stuff like that. We're not seeing into the screen or anything like that. Those having the ability to manipulate those, it's very similar to the work we do normally, but it's a little different, a bit of a brain bend because you're talking in video terms. You're talking in brightness, gamma contrast instead of, you know, intensity saturate. you like, you're, you're not, it's, it's just a slight syntax change. And you're thinking more about in points and out points as opposed to when is your thing, when's your show file, like when's your effect looping and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's it's a valuable skill that I highly recommend people people develop early and develop um, a mastery of because it's not that difficult actually. Any 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 particular resources you recommend or? Um, I highly recommend actually my my media server of choice right now because it is just feature rich enough that it does what we need in the film industry, but just, uh, just not feature rich enough that it's not, you know, $40,000 for the, for the yeah. hardware is, uh, PRG's M box, um, made by Matt Cork, uh, and his team at, at PRG. They are doing fabulous work with this, with this media server. That's very approachable, free to download has a great set of YouTube videos made by Matt. Uh, very amusing to watch. I love I love Matt's videos um, that that teach you how to use it. And um, it's a very it's a very approachable, very easy media server that can be controlled standalone or through a lighting console. Um, and there's a lot of really rad features that it has built into it. There's some features that it doesn't have that would be sure would be great if it could do, but it's not. It's not your D3. It's not your, it's not your hippo. It's not your uh, big giant rock and roll. It's like it's like the middle. It's like the middle ground media server. I kind of right. see it. You're not going to do you two with it, but it works really well for what we do on set. Exactly. I mean, if I was going to be doing you two, or if I was doing a big rock and roll concert, I'd be using D3 or hippo all day long. Yeah. Um, but frankly, for the work we need to do. We don't care, like, for for using video server for using media servers and video screens as lighting instruments and pixel mapping. Often, we don't care how it really looks when you're staring at it. We care about what it does to the actors' looks faces, like what it does to the environment. How does yeah. it affect the world? So, who cares if it looks like low res video games from 1997? Um, in fact. I did that on on a job where I was doing uh, this process via this rich man's process with video screens, and it was a subway, 
And I literally played uh, CGI subway content on the screens. And I colored them to be color accurate to the to white points, so that the so that the shadow was the shadow and the and the sunlight yes. was sunlight. But I mean, when you looked at the screens, it was pixelated garbage. But when yeah. you looked at when you looked at that silver New York New York City subway train, you could see the ba- you could see the bridge, every girder of that bridge passing by, and that yeah. and that's what sells the gag. That's what yeah. that's what really makes it look beautiful and and different and the thing that you can do with that is when if you're good at that sort of stuff you can do it quickly and um a lot of the thing i like about prg's mbox is how quickly i can modify and manipulate from nothing to a beautiful environment uh in terms of what's happening on the actors really quickly and i can adjust that and i can turn that around fast and i don't have to spend days prepping it to get it really where it needs to be like d d3 is a fabulous media server and it can do things it can do things that i could never even imagine it can do some crazy stuff but you need about six weeks to prep it to have it to really fine tune it into i mean people can do it faster of course with mastery of it but you need the time to really the time and resources to really put it together and frankly the film industry often doesn't give us the time and resources. You, it, yeah. It's about it's speed and price are the two most important factors in our industry. Um, good is often like when you, you can pick two uh, between fast, cheap and good, cheap, fast and good. Yeah. Um, they will always pick cheap and <laughs> cheap and fast over, yep. over good every day of the week, no matter how, exp- no matter what the budget of the job is, they will always pick that. What's your workflow from the moment you get the call like that one to like the first day of shooting? All right. Well, it's, it's, it's both radically different from show to show and radically the same from show to show. So, um, I'll just give you the, the, the basic Elton James has been called to do a job. Uh, initially there's the giddy talking to my wife saying, Oh my gosh, I got this job. Can you believe it? This is great. Or the, Holy cap. I got this job. Should I do it? Okay. I guess I'll do it. Yeah, that'll be fine. Um, and then after that gets going, I immediately call my next most important phone call, which is my lead off production systems tech or my lead rigging programmer. Uh, right now I've been using a wonderful gentleman, Mitch ball, who, uh, you should definitely interview. And if he keeps dodging your calls, let me know. And I'll give you, I'll give him a hard time for you. Calling you tomorrow, Mitch calling you tomorrow. (laughs) <laughs> um mitch is a mitch is a genius at the rigging side of oh i know how good he is department um and so my my second call immediately after getting the phone call from the gaffer is to call him and say hey i got this job are you available please tell me you're available please please pretty please um and then after I start like roughly assembling my team, because, you know, I, until I start the job, I don't know how big the team needs to be, but I'll find right. my chief lieutenant so that we can start finding, figuring out what we need from the show. Um, so as long as I've got my Mitch, I'll be fine. Um, yeah. And then after that's in place, I start the job. And the first thing I do when I get on the job after, you know, giving the gaffer a hug because I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years is I go straight over to the art department. I go to the art department. I introduce myself to the art department supervisor, the art, the supervising uh, art director. And if the production designer is there, I'll introduce myself to them as well. And then I immediately go to ask who the digital asset supervisor is, who is the person in charge of sending out digital PDFs of all of the lighting, uh, of all of the plans for the show. Um, they're, a, they're a similar nexus of information position within the art department. So I immediately make it my life's work to become their friend and do whatever I need to do to become their friend. Um, because my success is heavily, heavily dependent on getting information from them. And I feed a lot of information back to them. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But I immediately try to befriend the art department because 
they they have a lot of questions for us in lighting and we need so much information from them so once yeah. i get that set up i immediately start figuring out what stages i have what locations i have start doing whatever internet research i need to do to figure out the general floor plan of every set of every stage and i'll sit there in vectorworks and i'll draw out the uh the blank stage and it, for as much information as I have, I'll go down to where the four foot line is, where the cans are on the wall, where the stairs are that are going up to the perms, if there are perms, where the perms are uh, above, where the HVAC is that's blocking parts of the parts of the ozone between the perms, where the where the uh, where the perms are between the uh, catwalks in the ozone, where people can walk, where just because you never know, we might be like on Suicide Squad where I hung 600 image 80s above the perms in between the catwalks so that we could and so I needed to know where all that information I needed all that information so I could tell yeah. so I could figure out how many lights could fit in those spaces given what the geography of the stage was so I'll start gathering that information I'll spend my first week really just kind of information gathering and I'll when I get on site, I'll immediately go to the stage with my uh, Leica Disto and start doing site surveys and and confirming the information that the art department's given me um, to make sure that my stages are as accurate as 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 accurate as I can as 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 I can, well knowing that they don't have to be a hundred percent accurate. Like, what's six inches between friends? Right. Um, but it's incredibly valuable to have all this detail not just for the for the vanity of being able to show off a, a beautifully rendered 3d model of the interior of the stage but as i had said it's great for if you're doing a rig and you need to know where the grips could pos if like how many times have you put a rig in and been told there needs to be a softbox here and then they start putting it in and the grips say Oh, the softbox can't go here because we can't put motors here. It has to go over here. And that right. messes up everything. Yeah. But yeah, totally. if I have all that information ahead of time and I've thought about that, then very rarely does it happen where the grips can't put the motors where I tell them the motors need to go because yep. I have all of the architectural drawings of the space. And I've talked to the rigging key and I've I've made that that communication effort to make sure that I'm drawing things that are within the realm of possibility of his scope. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm including his information and his notes into my drawings so that he not only is getting an idea of what the gaffer is looking for, but I am able to give him drawings that he can turn around and hand to his crew and they can build from there. So we we were we were talking about Vectorworks a little while ago, and something I wanted to ask you. Yeah. What's the What's the coolest thing you've ever made for your Vectorworks template? Like you ever made a BB or? I've some... definitely made a I've definitely made a BB truck. Um, yeah. And I think that's pretty cool. I I love that. I, actually, I'd say the coolest thing I ever made was a. Uh, was a construction crane truck a truck based construction crane that yeah. was that we used for suicide squad um that we hung a it it was i think it was a 450 foot tall crane uh it was the largest crane that you could find that was truck based and wasn't one of those like skyscraper building cranes yeah it was the largest crane that we could find in north america uh, and we were supposed to get two of them, and then we lost one of them because it got hired on a job to go build a, a skyscraper in Saudi Arabia. Uh, <laughs> like, that kind of ridiculous. Like, yeah, we're we got like, money. We haven't got that much money. Yeah. I mean, it was like a $40 million contract that we lost yeah. it to. And we were like, I, 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 that makes sense. We can't fault you for that. No. But I built a, I built a, uh, a two-scale fully rendered i spent i spent like two weeks building it out just from purely from photos building out a 3d model of that crane um i'll probably never use that crane again 
but it's in my template. It's going to be in every single Vectorworks file that I do from now on. So. Right, that's that's the that's like the heap of the nerd pile for you, right there. Yeah, exactly. So I, I you know, the the things that uh, there there are a few things. There are all things like that. There's things that I probably will never use again that are like my favorite parts of my Vectorworks uh, workflow. Like, or or the thing the things that I've done like uh, my first sky panel model that I built. Uh, I had built before I ever saw the sky panel. Um, all I had was Aries uh, mechanical drawings from their from their brochure, um, and that's actually one thing I teach in uh, Chris Cotone's in my Vectorworks classes. We were teaching in the three D modeling portion of the class. I teach how to draw something before you've ever seen it from just the documentation you r randomly download from the website, um, because it actually isn't that hard. Um, if somebody, if you can find mechanical drawings of something, you can make a 3d model of it. Yeah. It's just a matter of how much patience and time do you want to spend on it? Um, so I, I, I'm particularly proud of, of some of my, of some of my, uh, sky panel models that I've made. Uh, I mostly use, and, and some of the ones you'll see, uh, in my, in my files that I use now, I mostly use a lower resolution one because, when you have 40 sky panels in a model or you have 200 sky panels in a model, it makes a big difference in the way your computer reacts because there are so many polygons. So I have yeah. a simplified one, which is just like a light blue solid with, with a yoke that's roughly sky panel shape. That's air, yeah. that's airy blue color because you know, at least that way, you know, it's an it's S60 a, it's a sky panel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then of course, you know, I've got my, my image eighties that, you know, uh, I've classed out whether or not if you're, I've classed it out so that if you uh, change tubes to uh, daylight or tungsten or 2800 or super blues and it, that it changes the color of the band on the little T <laughs> on the T12 bulb inside of the body. Nobody sees that except for right. somebody who's gone in and like, you know, zoomed in on the face of your image 80. But, you know, yeah. I know it's there and it makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things. Exactly. Um, and that actually, that, that actually comes to like another point of a, a question that I wanted to ask you, because it's, you know, it is the little things that make all the difference. And, and what steps do you take um, to make your obviously very complex drawings um, easy to understand for, you know, like the guys that on your crew that aren't necessarily programmers or or drafts people? Well, I think one of the things to always remember when it comes to drafting, first off, is a picture is worth a thousand words. And then also think about who your audience is. Um, your drawings, the nice thing is, if you make a complicated, beautiful, fully rendered 3D drawing, that's great. Build it in a way that you can hide and show things to show different audiences and then make different handouts to different audiences. The, the riggers who are just worried about where the lights are going and what the spacings between the lights are on that piece of pipe, that's all the information they have, they need. Your DMX techs can worry about what their addresses are on each fixture and maybe give the riggers the fixture ID so that if the DMX techs have gotten to already pre-addressing it, they can fix it before they grab the right light. But it's like knowing who your audience is and then trying to be as efficient with your callouts as possible about, you know, you can make certain assumptions that, you know, if I, if I put a measurement, if I've got, if you stare at a drawing and I've got image 80s all on eight foot centers and I just make one measurement of one of them, I probably don't need to clutter up the rest of the drawing with uh call outs for each measurement i just need to just have a few spot measurements so that you can get the gist of it um and then trying to stay consistent as possible throughout the show so i always for my label legends i always have my sky panel i i have my label legends be the fixture id is the color of the fixture type um so all sky panels are always light airy light blue because it's airy um Kino flows are always purple for me. I don't know. I like purple. See, I use yellow. I, I use purple. I use yellow for tungsten. Bose uh, used yellow for tungsten. Don't know why. See, I use red for tungsten. 
Yeah, I, I thought about that for a while, but yellow feels more tungsten to me for some reason. I don't know. Because, you know, yellow light, warm light feels like the sun, sun's yellow. That True. That's the logic in my brain. Mm-hmm. If, welcome to the weirdness that is my brain. Um, <laughs> moving lights are generally always green to me, different shades of green. Um, I don't know why. I just picked green one day randomly. And and do you do you translate? I try and because you know like I'm, I'm a very color driven person. So generally the the colors that I'll use on my plot are also the colors that I'll use in my groups on the console. Absolutely. I in fact I've purposely picked colors that I can easily find a color in my console from the quick select colors, not from the custom colors, so yeah. that I can quickly go okay, bup, 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 and then. If I have to go to the bathroom and somebody has to grab, sit at my console for something, they know that the, that the blue groups are the sky panels. Yeah. They just know because looking at a map, oh, this is blue, that's blue. Great. Hey, Elton, how do you utilize rendering? Well... So I use rendering, uh, renderings meaning uh, full 3D, uh, um, uh, full renderings of 3D drawings. Um, I'll use miniature renderings of every set on every single plot that I have. Uh, And part of that is that I use them there as a little guidepost to kind of show the macro of the set and how it fits into the stage. Often I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And then when I'm doing details um in my drawings i will also utilize renderings uh depending on what we're depending on what kind of information i need to have if i need to be showing information that is exact tape measurable measurements i probably won't render something out i'll probably stay something that's a low, lower line count easier easier to read but if it's something that's more like Hey, I need to give you the idea of what we're working on here and what we're what you're building. Um, that's when I will use my renderings. And then the other place I'll use renderings um, is that I'll for previs. So like I've got, I have two main audiences for my drawings in Vectorworks. Uh, the first audience is the rigging crew. That is the crew, the people who are building our light pl- building the light plots in reality, and uh, that consists of the grips, the ring electricians, and the off-production lighting control team. Um, but then there's a whole other equally as important te- uh, audience, which is the gaffer and the DP. And a lot of the times I will be using fully rendered, fully 3D models as basically tour guides so that I can act as a tour guide for the DP about what we're shooting uh, and and how his how his light plot is going to affect the set, and put a camera where he tells me he needs to see a camera, and I can tell him, oh yeah, if you look here, you'll see we need to have the the lights about ten foot trim, so that the they'll be outside of a eighteen mil camera or whatever. Um, so that's it's it's a valuable like a picture's worth a thousand words kind of tool where I can. I can just give him that information without having to fully explain it. I can just, you know, show him a little picture showing, okay, I know we're going to have to have a shot from over here and a shot from over here and a shot from over here. So why don't I just make some quick renderings and make a handout with my 3D plot that shows those angles so that they get an idea of how the light plot fits into the overall set. Are you able to share an example with us? Yeah, in fact, I'm just pulling up. There are two big sets that I was going to show you guys from Suicide Squad. One of them is the, uh, we built this giant beach in the back lot of uh, Trilla Studios. At the time, it was Pinewood Studios. Boom. Oh, yeah. That's, That's a sexy drawing right there, right there. Look at that, guys. So this was a giant beach set that we built. Oh, show us your crying. Oh, I gotta share the crane after after spending so much time talking about how great this. I crane know, right? Is. I'll be disappointed if I don't get to see the crane. I know. Um, and I even put a, a movement radius on the crane, right there. See, there's the crane. Nice. I put a movement radius so that you could see where the arm is, a classed out movement radius, so that you could see how the giant softbox of eighty eight sky panels 
was going to affect our actor, our hero actor right here in the middle of the beach. Super cool. In addition to this, we also had uh, a bunch of petty bones that were reaching up and above. You can just see down here and over here and here. We had a three-point petty bone rig that was running a spider cam that had um, two moving lights on a commutator with, uh, with batteries wirelessly controlled uh, to be a helicopter gag. Um, nice. as the helicopter comes up and over the tree line. And then as one of the bad guys grabs the helicopter and it starts spinning around the searchlight on the front spins around on its axis. So we wanted to have not only the moving light movement of it, but we wanted to have the commutator axis of it all as well. So we, we rigged this wow, whole crazy, cool. silly, oh my gosh, it was so silly. And we had to have it so that the moving light was, uh, focused up on, and it had to follow an actor because uh, as she was running around, as Harley Quinn was running around the beach, it was a searchlight on the helicopter, so it had to follow her around. So we actually hooked it up to a, um, I put, we Velcroed some GoPro cameras to it. They weren't actually GoPro Pro cameras, but they were uh, cameras from drones, from DJI tr drones. We Velcroed to the outside of a moving light. And we had, and we put the moving light on a lightweight camera head um, that we were controlling wirelessly. So I, I was controlling the moving light. So it, it had its own pan and tilt. And then it was in a camera head that was wirelessly controlled via like a pan and tilt fluid head wireless control. Yeah, yeah. So that somebody, and so that we had one of our lamp ops wearing um, the uh, AR drone goggles so that they were seeing the camera <laughs> the cameras that we had velcroed to the moving light face so they could see its face so they could keep it focused exactly roughly on harley quinn and i could still wow. because i still had pan and tilt control within that i could be running a little like shaky gag on it so that it was still doing a helicopter gag and then when yeah. it had to go crazy i could lock it up and make it do crazy things and it would spin off and go it was it was the coolest crazy rig we ever did. I go into this because I wanted to show you um, from there the documentation that I had to do to make that story into something we actually rigged. Um, the reason I wanted to show this plot is because we actually had to do a lot of very, very specific documentation for it mm -hmm. to be able to accomplish what we needed to do. Here's my basic light plot for this rig. That's where we were parking the cranes with their movement radius on how far they could reach. That's where we had to park the petty bones for the commutator flight zone that I had to, that I had to mark out within there. And then, um, so I always start with like a, a spotting plan or, a, or a, a more macro plan of the whole plot. So it doesn't give all of the information, but it does give you exact counts of everything that's in there. Moving on, this helps answer my question, your question about renderings. How do I use renderings? So here are some renderings of the actual drawing that give a little better idea of, like on this particular one, I wanted to show, I wanted to show the DP just how small that softbox was going to be, exactly how far away it was going to be. Because he was very concerned that when he was back at the water line, that the softbox would be in the back of the actor's head or in the tree's head where it was yeah. difficult to VFX out. So I was like, so I had to give him some examples of how that was going to work. And then I had to give some, some, some other 3D examples of how the whole, of how the whole uh, set ties together with all of our condors and various cranes mm -hmm. and stuff that we had on this particular set. Um, and then, you know, went into further details depending on, so there was, from there, I did a full distro map showing where all the runs were going for the uh, Rick and Gaffer, uh, a data plan. Cause you know, this was, this is roughly the size of two football fields, this entire yeah. set. And so this was, this was, we ran a fiber backbone connecting the two, the two sides of the set. Um, and then we had to run fiber up each crane because the crane arms were longer than 300 feet. Um, yeah. 
so to control to to control sky panels on the cranes, I had to have fiber optic going up the arm, which was kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and then for the spider cam, uh, we had to have a whole nother level of uh, renderings and discussions about what we wanted to do for the spider cam. So, like, I made I made more more detailed drawings showing roughly where the the lines had to go for the crane for the petty bones and then show a how the triangulation needed to work so that the spider cam guys could figure out how they were going to map their motion control for the spider cam so that was pretty fun that's cool that, yeah that was a particularly weird different set um so that was fun and then on to a more traditional one um this one was on stage one for the same job. So this was another set on a state on a stage. So it's a more traditional set. Um, so I typically will stay away from like coloring the walls. I'll leave them white or gray often because, you know, I don't during prep, I don't know what's going on with how they're going to dress it. And they often won't show us how they're going to paint it until too late. So then I won't get to it. Um, but I will always make sure I put a texture on the back of the sets and this helps it look a little more professional, but it also just gives the functional idea of, you know, where the back of the set is now, you know, what's on camera, what's off camera, uh, by it's got this set flat back to it. Um, and on this particular job, they gave me the, uh, source image that they were going to put on the, uh, translite. So I actually just put it on the translite. I was really excited about that one. <laughs> it's always exciting when they know what the translite image is going to be. And you're like, oh, cool. I'll just put this in the drawing. Um, so this particular set was, you know, it was a villa in uh, Corte Maltese, which is the fictional uh, uh, Latin American country. Uh, and this was where the president of the country lived and he had a spa. So this is the spa room in here. Um, and then he also had a wine cellar that was also his torture room, which was in here, which was just looks basically like a bunker with blue screens around. So on this particular set, uh, we have low ceilings. We have this weird portico here and we have a small window. So I needed to give the DP and the gaffer an idea of how much blue screen they were actually going to see depending on where they were going to be. So this is where I use renderings as a real valuable tool for me, because this shows, I can show pretty well that I don't need a lot of blue screen for that tiny little window because it's got this parapet wall right there. And unless you're right in the, right in the window and looking straight up, it's not really going to be affected by very much. Um, and so when you go outside of the set, Let's go outside of the set right now by doing this. Boop. We did put too much blue screen in, but at least we knew we did. We did it because we already had 35 foot tall blue screen stock. Uh, the grips had that. So that's just what we put in. So this is my favorite part. Um, and I can't take all the credit for this particular stage because uh, about half of this was drawn by Scotty and Josh Thatcher and half of it was mm -hmm. drawn by me uh, because Scotty and I often will share our stage uh, drawings with each other uh, and then, you know, edit it as we see fit. I mean, I, I always, I don't know if you do this, but I always try and find the, like the one person on my crew that's like curious about what I'm doing. And I'm like, all right, come over here. I'll show you show how it works like you know if you want to turn a sky panel on push the blue one and then hit the intensity palette and then the color temperature that you want you got that cool i'm gonna to go to the bathroom yeah i i always find that guy it's um i've gotten a little la lazier at that recently since i've had the fortune i've been fortunate enough to have a dedicated onset dmx tech uh, right. who ends up being the guy who covers me when i go to the bathroom but i always try to find because there's always, every job I've ever been on, there's always some guy that's like, you know, I want to be a board op. And I'm like, you do? Let's talk about that. Come over here, kid. Show me what you <laughs> show me what you know. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, the thing, as 
you know, as this web series shows, and I'm sure that you also can attest us people that work in film. We love, we love to talk. Um, mm-hmm. We're mm-hmm. happy to tell yeah, stories do. and we're yeah. happy to share information. We're a very, we're, we're, uh, we're an industry that is a, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the term that somebody said the other day that really struck with, stuck with me. I can't remember it, but it was like, we're, we're, we're an experiential industry. It's not just a go to film school, learn how to do our craft. We're, we're craftsmen. You, you, we're an apprenticeship interest industry. That's what they had said. Um, which is, it feels so true because really everything I've learned, I've learned from being on sets and uh, every workflow. There are so many things that I've brought from outside of the industry, but really it's all been refined by working in the industry and, learning from others, the times I've had, the, the times I've been blessed enough to work with next to other board ops, like Scotty Barnes and Josh Crimmins and Josh Thatcher, or John Crimmins and Josh Thatcher, um, have been incredibly enlightening moments and times when I've been able to work with colleagues like you and David Kane and other board ops where I've been able to just even discuss kind of our methods and see where we do things that are similar and where we do things that are different. Uh, I always walk away from those conversations with new things, valuable yeah. things for me. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, and, and I think it comes back to like my whole idea with like this, with this discussion with you and with other people, um, you know, there's a plethora of videos out there. Um, I remember watching one, it was, you know, it was you and Josh and Scotty and Dave Slodke and, and all oh, this sort of the, stuff. And, the high end forum. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, like I'm not a hog programmer, any, prog, hog programmer anymore, but listening about your workflows and your organization and, and the things that you do every day that, that work for you, it's like, well, that's a good idea. I'll take a bit of that. And I like the way that that person does that. And it's, it adds to the collab, collaborative spirit of what we do. And you can just, you can learn something just from having a conversation with someone. And, oh, yeah. And, seeing you guys do stuff like that. And, you know, there was a whole bunch of um, webinars and stuff that members did during, you know, the COVID shutdown and all that. I was like, well, I don't really want this conversation to end. I want to continue this. It's like, I want to pick people's brains and, and, you know, like having a discussion like this, you and me, we're talking about different ways that we do things and different ideas. Maybe there's someone out there that doesn't do our job. That's like, well, one, that sounds really interesting. And I'd like to do that. And, how do these guys do it? I'm just you know, like, I'm keen to have that conversation, you know? Yeah. We are going to start something today. This is a new thing. And you, you get to be the first one to do this. We're going to call this Dobbin Your Mate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which basically means you get to call out the next person that should do a video with me. Who do you think that should be? It absolutely has to be Mitch Ball. I'm Mitch sorry. Mitch Ball? I mean, I think you need to have a conversation with Mitch Ball um, about... Uh, the role and the emerging role of the off-production um, of the off-production network systems guru yeah. uh, rigging programmer because it is a it is a it is a position that has changed so much in a very short period of time because it's gone from a position that doesn't exist to a position that is now almost and like the equivalent to the rigging department. Mm-hmm as the main unit board op is to the yeah. shooting department mm-hmm. um where basically my off-production programmer is my rigging gaffer yeah um and that's and that's a very interesting change that's happened in lighting control and that's really only happened in the last two years yeah yeah all right mitch well you've been put on notice yeah mitch do it <laughs> Well, listen, Elton, um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It was uh, a pleasure to have you and have you you. tell us your story and your experience. Um, Keep an eye out. There are probably going to be comments and stuff that people are going to ask questions that only you can answer. So we'll we'll keep in touch with that. And, um, yeah, man, thanks again. This has been great. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, It's always a pleasure to get a nerd out with you. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, Ask any questions, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. So stressful. Hang, Hang on. Okay.
Do we go on three or do we go on go? Is it three and go or just three go? Uh, One, two, three. Okay, wait, we can do that better, you guys. Okay, Okay, ready? Yeah. So, one, two, three, and then we clap. Okay. 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 All right. One, two, three. It's the delay. I, like, it's the delay, but Chris, you and I already were in the same room. We're in the same room. Actually. Now, mind you, when that's upside down, you have to start upside down and then flip it because... It's a tail slate. It's a tail slate. All right, ready? Yeah. So, okay, Chris, you count. One, two, three.